welcome to this week's Mad Axman podcast. This week there are six of us as Pete got called away on domestic duties, so that does make things rattle along a little bit quicker. Um, no offence to Peter intended. And this time we talk about the Nicophorian Byzantine Army in Art de la Guerre. We talk about our painting. There's a bit of a longer chat on Tabletop Simulator, the new online way of playing games that we've all discovered. And we bring in a new feature, which is teaching Timmy about Napoleonics, in which I attempt to learn from the gang of five this week how the Napoleonic Wars actually worked and what it was all about. Um, finally, Andy's quiz, of course, makes a reappearance, so look out for that music. Sit back, enjoy the podcast, and enjoy your painting. This means war. This means war. Okay, and welcome to number 10 of the Lockdown Podcasts. We've got a, a slightly, um, I was going to say slim down um, crew here, but reduced in number is probably more, more politically correct um, and, and slightly less rude to Peter, who's ended up um, doing domestic duties of, of some sort this evening. Um, so he's not here. So we've only got six people to to entertain you and and keep the chat going. Um, as is traditional, we will we'll start the week's podcast with that classic question of what have you been painting this week? And I think my top left corner is um, is Simon with your druids behind you, who I think we talked about last week briefly. But but what's what's been happening in your was it Swedish Seven Years War um, world? Yeah, so the, uh, I've achieved a grand total of one unit of painting this week. <laughs> oh right, okay. Yeah, so it's been uh, it's been a slow week, um, but I've got my first unit. So it's um, three bases of Swedish grenadiers. So I've been trying to work out how to get their yellows and all that. And um, they're now based up and just need to flock them. So was that a time when grenadiers were still throwing grenades or are they just people with different hats? Uh, apparently they, they did throw grenades as well. So I've seen a few images of um, uh, Swede- of these guys running around with a, with a, with a grenade. So um, they got grenades and big rifles and a regimental gun. So they look, they look quite cute. Okay, so it's that's how they got their elite status because um, uh, throwing grenades was even more hazardous in the 17th and 18th century than it is today. It depends how far you throw them, I guess. Really, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the key determinant. Of it. So, what? How are the figures kind of panning out? Are you still still chuffed with them? Are they still ticking the boxes, or are you suddenly looking at an acre of these sort of things and going, oh, "Why did I start?" Um, no, they're, they're quite nice. So when you first look at the QRF or the free core miniatures, you, it's a little bit hard to spot the detail. But once you, um, especially once you give them a, a wash, like so I use the army painter, the, um, the little dippy uh, wash, not the, the big, not the big, big tin. tin one, um, it gets into the cracks and then a lot of the detail starts popping out. So I know it's not the scientific term, but they're fancy big bear hats they wear, you know, the big... Um, Mitres? That's the one, mitres. Um, when you first look at it, you can't see the detail, but when you give them a nice wash, you can start picking out all the, the, the attempt at an emblem and things like that. And then, you know, their um, lace, oh, sorry, the, um, the belts and the, the coat and all that, all the detail starts coming out. So um, it's quite good. Just trying to do yellow is a peak. So I'm oh, trying to do such, Swedish. Oh, colour, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, uh, what, so, which, what paint are you using for yellow? Because I've, I've got like three or four that never, never, you never really get work. Strong, they're too weedy. Yeah, they just get too washed out. What, what's your secret? Or, or, um, Willow, if you've not got a secret, what's, what are you attempting to do? So I, I'm uh, asking you this before we ask Tams in for the real answer, just to, so, uh, to string, string this out a bit. But, um, so what I've done is I've been using uh, primarily Vallejo yellow to give that a go, but I did cheat and I deferred to our learned expert, Tamsin, and I've been asking Tamsin all week how to right. make some better colour ye- yellow. So, um, Tamsin, over to you. <laughs> yeah, because based, based on what Simon was saying that he had, mm-hmm. to get the, the so it's a saffron yellow that the, sweet, the Swedish sort of cuffs and underclothes. Yeah. And it's not a bright yellow. I think if I was going going with it, I'd probably use Tanya, Vallejo model colour tan yellow, because it's a slightly yeah. creamier, brownish yellow. But with what Simon has had, I suggested using the yellow mixed with a bit of brown and some white to bring it down. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's worked quite well. So the first one I tried, um, I 
ignored Tamsin's expertise and went and read a, a read a, um, some website about how to mix saffron and yellow, and they said mix yellow and orange. So it came out orange. Orange. So yeah, was, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a fail. So I went back to the learned expert. And lo and behold, the saffron or more mustardy yellow came out where it had that more slightly deeper color to it. Um, and then with the only paint of wash, it came out uh, all right. Is there something uh, technical about yellow paint just doesn't have... Um... Blake Brown will do it, yeah. Plague Brown. Okay. What was that one? Cascade color Plague Brown. Really, really good. If I could get to a wargaming store, I'd probably buy some. Cascade <laughs> color. Well. Cascade. Then hold it steady, rather wave it around. Some, yeah. it, it's like a fillet. It was basically, I think it's a basically a fillet show. Is, it, is that right, Tamsin? You need to hold Tamsin it. Right it's not in front of the screen. A bit more in front of you. No, a bit more. Left a bit, left a bit, right a bit. Back, you know, yeah, I know we did blankety blank. Yeah. 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 So it's played brown. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the game colour, yeah, it is Vallejo. And from what I remember, sort of the game colour paints are somewhat thicker mm. and possibly have more pigment in. Okay. Yeah. And model color and is that plague brown actually a prop is a yellow with one of these fancy names is that basically it it's tan yellow it is tan yellow yeah okay. i mean i use okay. it a lot of it might have a try but um coming back to tim what you're saying about yellow it is a pig oh it's a nightmare no because i've yeah. got i've got army painted demonic yellow which is just a bit hapless and i've ended up you know mixing it with um bleach bone and, and all other sorts of things but the thing i've not thought you know all of them make it a bit darker and a bit more mustardy but whether actually adding some whites back in actually brings it back up that's the bit i've not really thought about before whites will tend to desaturate it and uh, make it more pastel but right. the best thing to do with yellows is have a different color undercoat if sort of brown or i have heard her depending on what what end result you want i a brown and i've actually heard people you suggesting using pink pink as an undercoat what, like yeah. flesh pink or, or shocking pink? Could use, I guess you could use flesh, pe flesh pink. But wow, well, okay. I've just been using white because that's uh, that, that's the, uh, no, the one kind of white, 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 uh, white, white I use. Out. Yeah. If I ever have to um, paint yellow, I tend to do a layer of sand color first. Yeah, yeah. It sort of like gives it something to go on to because it sort of like but lightens yellow, it up. I, yellows, I yell, something like yellow ochre, sand yellow, anything like that. It's good okay, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of sand yellow, yellow. Oranges, reds. Mm. Buff. Yeah, yeah buff, buff, yeah. Buff. I was okay. thinking buff as well, but um, all right, I'll try that because I've got yeah. some more green ideas to yeah, pick up. Because so. I'd always just gone with that sort of assumption of it's going to be thin, so do as white an undercoat as possible yeah. um, and then do a couple of layers and then slightly get disappointed. But the idea of doing, and then I ended up mixing it with the tan sort of paint, but... But yeah, actually doing an undercoat that's a, got a slight pigment to it and then putting the yellow onto it. Um, like Dave's just waving some samurai banners at us, which, um, which yeah. look really, nice. really sharp, actually. Yeah. That's a really good yellow. That's really worked well. well. And that's uh, Vallejo flat yellow. Exactly marked flat yellow, but I leave it upside down in my... Uh, yeah, I think it's one of those paints that needs to be left upside down, isn't it? Very it's nice. I've never tried that. Oh, I know there's some of my paints just live upside down because you just want yeah. to get that pigment. Otherwise, it all just sinks to the bottom. Even with little steel ball bearings in it, just you, you almost want to kind of make them um, mm. with extra pigment and, and drain some of the other stuff out. Well, speaking of steel, but steel bearing, ball bearings. So just before, just as we we're going to lockdown, um, Dave recommended some steel, uh, those ball bearings, ordered them. They arrived that evening. Probably threw the bag out into the recycling bin, didn't I? Oh, <laughs> oh, they're just too small. Just too yeah, small. Yeah, because they, they were just in that little um, you know, plastic bag, bag, like a druggy bag. And I put it down on the table, and um, the, the, my, my, my replacement were due last uh, on the 14th of, uh, of May. So I still haven't seen anything, so I might see them next week. So sob complete fail so I've, I've had the decal fail and now i've had the ball bearing fail oh dear. yeah so you got wrong size decals and and you threw your balls away in the um yeah in the trash wow what a nightmare oh disaster so so you've done one unit of grenadiers is that just you focused on one unit or have you been doing some prep across the base of the army um primarily just focusing on one uh one unit so it's um been one of those one of those weeks so um I've only had the, the brain space to sit down and just focus on one unit. Right. Crack, okay. get, get the 
get that prototype working. It's like, okay, this is going to work for the other um, four units and all the other, the mounted and all that. The rest and then the I army. can um, start rolling it out. Okay. And then Tamsin, given we've, um, you know, you spent your week just answering technical queries from Simon um, on an off podcast way, um, which is, you know, slightly cheating, I feel. But, but at least we've managed to drag the conversation back to it and get some content out of it this week yeah. rather than it, it just happening without um, without being recorded, in which case yeah, it's indeed. not really true. Yeah. So what, what have you been um, focusing on this week, having finished well, the, the that classic Perry army? Well, if I move out of the way so you can see... Aha, uh -huh, it's more of your um, barrels and yeah, fire hydrants. Scattered and... The scattered terrain that I said I was working on last week, last week so I've got filled up pr pretty much a, an A4, sh A4 boards. Wow, wow. Well. Wow, that's a lot of scatter, and that looks like yeah. most of it looks like it's it's boxes of military equipment. Boxes, yeah. <laughs> boxes of all sorts, all sorts of boxes. There's a couple of crates with rifles, fruit, I fruit, fruit, veg, and fish. Okay. Barrel barrels, oil drums, and, and who make who, hydrants. And who makes Isn't that, that the sort of thing to have a, have a gunfight in a in a warehouse type thing? Yeah, uh, the fire hydrants, oil drums, and trash cans were Fenris games, and everything else was Ainsty. Ah, good. Um, I got Ainsty. Yeah. It does look like a lot of fire hydrants. I'm counting about uh, a dozen or something like that. So Yeah, a dozen. So Mega City 1 is never going to burn down then? There's going to be a fire hydrant on every corner. No, that, that's they're actually for my Salutesville project. I my pulp my pulp gaming. Ah, uh, okay then. Like right. So so lots of them will get knocked over by 1920 style cars and. Yeah. and yeah, actually, a fire scooting. hydrant would be a good would be a good uh, thing to have in an Anglo-Saxon village for when the Vikings turn up. Come on, Andy. What's the punchline? No, it's just occurred to me as a as a terrain, you know, funky terrain piece, you know, for an army uh, base. If you did an Anglo-Saxon village, you could have a fire hydrant, you know, to so put the fires out when the Vikings turn up. <laughs> Sorry, I was expecting some yeah. complicated punchline yeah. there. I think these five people just go, "Where's the gag? Where's the gag?" Okay, all right. And um, that looks uh, it looks a good red for that fire hydrant. You look like you've done some um, some good solid some good solid colouring on that one what's um what's the fire hydrant red because it looks like it's got a real shine to it oh it's started off with an airbrush airbrushing i think it was german red brown mixed with scarlet to get base or it might have been whole red and scarlet to get I, the undercoat then successive layers of dry brushing with flat red and then vermilion okay so it's just a lot of dry brushing to give it a real ping dry brushing and a little bit of layering okay and is that is this project now done or is this something that's going to come up for next week that's done i've got some sci-fi scattered terrain on the table at the moment i've sort of primed and sort of done initial highlighting on and today i've been assembling assembling all the judge dread miniatures oh there's the bikes and other you know, yeah. burps and things like that yeah so it's world, it's world of dread staying at 28 mil okay uh right. not really it's not no, it's a bit, bit tricky on a video camera i think that one yeah that figures one. with belly wheels yes the fatties hey, excellent you like that idea okay. always always like the fatties yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay and then the bikes yeah. and things like that that's good that's okay so then um, if we go around the screen andy um you appear to be outside the house of commons on your zoom background today um, yeah, well, yeah, well, that's partly outside the House of Commons and still partly in your kitchen. I think yeah. it must be your no, that, that, iPad green screen thing not quite working properly. No, at least I've got something of a background which is better than nothing. It was meant yeah. to be meant to be the Viking ship outside the House of the Commons. So what? Yeah. what so has it been still the um, the Danes and the Saxons and things this week? Or it, yeah, I've actually okay. I've actually finished finished painting them and I'm just waiting for the base to dry and then I'll sort of um, flock it and then that's that's our whole project done. So now I've got to think of something else to do. So um, do you have anything waiting in the wings, or um, um few are we going to yeah, come I mean, up with something for you? Well, no, no. I mean, before 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 you send me off to paint a Chinese army, which I haven't got, um, I think the next thing is uh, I've got a pack of those um, those phalangites, but I probably have to wait till the weekend till I can muck about with the drill because I've got a vice for it now, and then drill the hands for that, and then I'll paint them, and then I've got some late Roman. Uh, 
legionaries to fill up, to finish off that army, and then that's all the Kickstarter stuff done. Um, the Irish arrived with their wolf wolfhounds. Ah, oh, okay, those twenty-eight male plastic ones. Yeah. yeah. So at some stage you've got to stick them together. That might be the next project. Or I'm thinking I might go completely off topic and paint some Italian planes and or ships I've got for World War Two. For that cruel seas thing, is that or no 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 this is um, something different this is for kind of multi convoy type thing. These are one one twenty four hundred scale ships. All right. Well look, I think you know the, the, it'd be interesting to get your views maybe next week on those Atlantic um, Irish because that's a new box, isn't it? And yeah. there's so many dark age 28 mil manufacturers and some brilliant yeah, okay. ones. Well, I'll, 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 I'll do that next. I'll, I'll, I'll try and stick some of them together. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see yeah. how they all fit together and you yeah. know, how they might fit together with some of the, all the other ones. Okay. Yeah, right, you, so, to have, you need to get a lot of right hands for them. So you've got a fair amount of selection of weaponry. All right. Lots of, lots of spares and bits and pieces then. Good. Yeah. This means war. Dave, what about you? I waved a samurai banner at us a while ago. Um, what's in your your painting bunker then, um, as we speak? The samurai are, I would say, finished. <laughs> <laughs> With a proviso that I've, I've put the sand onto the command base, so that just needs paint applying to it. So those um, those banners, are they, so those images on the banners, they're the L, not LBMS, they're the Veni Vici Vici, I'd say. Yeah, the Veni Vici Vici, so that's Takeda Shingen's army. Bossman looks like he's sitting on the loo. Yeah, he is, yeah. He's sat there on his seat. His horse is down here, ready to, for him to gallop off into action when I want to commit him. Uh, so they've been fun, that's finished. The four heavy infantry are done. I think I've put too many banners, they've all got a huge bloody banner on them. Don't think you can put too many banners in samurai armies. No, no. The more the more banners, the better. You've seen my samurai. Everyone's yeah. got a banner. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of banners in this army. Yeah. So that they're all done. There's no, that's you know. There's I mean I think actually there's two bases of um, monks, which I'll do at some point, but they're not necessary for the army. Uh, that's that done. Oh, I've got your light horse. You sent me through the post. Oh, good. Yep, the extra yeah, light horse then. for that army. You need to paint them up at some point. Yeah, that's the point is. Uh, I'm just finishing off a couple of bases of Scythian foot archers, bowmen, because a couple of bases of bowmen will be useful. Is that something you you forgot to paint when you did the Kickstarter earlier, or is it just? Um, well, the, the Kickstarter's all done. I mean, there's, there's a more than enough for a complete army, but I just thought I'd, I might as well do the bowmen as an option. And you just happen to have them lying around. <laughs> yeah, they, they were from the Kickstarter, but it's just all right. Okay, a bits pieces to finish off with. Uh, waiting for the Egyptians to arrive. They've, they've been dispatched. Ooh. Got marks to uh, Ian. Very yep. quick. Thorough service. No, that is really quick. He's, he's <laughs> redoing the website as well at the moment, isn't he? With, um, is he? Yeah, I think there's a new website being put up as well. So I'm surprised he's got time to do casting. It's all this publicity we're giving him. Yeah, it could be it. <laughs> yeah. Both the people listening, maybe one of them has placed yeah. an order. <laughs> that could be it. He's overwhelmed. That could be frightening. So, no, I mean, I've painted up the bases, the trial bases I got from him. <clears throat> Looking forward to getting, six, I mean, I've ordered four chariots just to sort of see which ones are which and what they, how they fit on bases and things like that. Yeah, there's, I think, when, if I remember, it's a long time ago since I did mine, but there's a lot of, like, bending the, the um, is it the yoke, the kind of the stick that goes up to the two horses? If you bend it into kind of an S shape, you can, you can just about fit them on a 40 by 40. Yeah. But, but otherwise it is just too long and, and you need to think about either cutting it or going 50 by 40 or something. Well, um, I'm, I'm waiting for that to be an issue, but I'll, I'll cross that Rubicon when it gets there. Yeah. <laughs> that Egyptian <laughs> Rubicon. I'm mixing up the um, chariots. I might even use some Syrian chariots. But mm. Let's see what the Egyptian ones look like. There. Well, I've, with my uh, Hebrew army, what I've done with the chariots, because some of them are meant to be occasionally allied, is I've just got different flags, uh, depending on whether they're Hebrew or allied and different shape flags depending on whether they're heavy or light chariots because the models are all the same yeah but, you know you can just show the different types of units by the flags yeah i think for some of my occasionally you get heavy chariots and i don't know whether there's a way of doing that with giving them more chariot runners maybe i don't think it's historical but it's just a way of differentiating two horse chariots from other ones and having a couple of the little javelin mini guys on the base 
to to run alongside because they all had chariot runners and nobody really knows what they were but as a way to say uh, the ones with chariot runners or heavy or, or the ones who've got red and white stripy hats uh heavy or something <laughs> like that you know there's there's different ways they go faster stripes yeah go faster stripes down the side different ways of doing it well i think it, i think on a 40 mil base you might have difficulty fitting everything in i suspect yes yeah yeah but you know cram them in they're not i don't think those horses are that that bulky you can definitely still get a runner either side if you wanted it's not it's not too difficult no okay. maybe okay all right well, i think adam is painting away so before we come to to adam to round up this bit um i think this week for me has been been about making a real dent in those hungarians i know we talked about it i think adam you actually asked me last week how long i thought it would take and six to eight weeks it said six to eight, and i think i'm now bringing that number down actually Good lad. which um so I, I did a a thing that i don't normally a, I think I said I hate painting horses because there's so many straps to do. And I think that's partly how I've, I've always tried to base stuff before I, you know, base it and then undercoat it. And this one, I, this is my first, other than the 10 mil French, um, this is my first 15 mil army with lolly sticks and using, you know, four horses on a lolly stick. And I just found having that and being able to pick that thing up, made painting the straps so much easier could <laughs> be able to turn the damn horse round which is a ridiculous thing to have learned after uh, 30 years or something but um or, or maybe more but it it just made it seem so much more achievable and then i i've really worked on the horses with with getting some different colors into them those different um coat to arms horse colors and trying to do that bit with the the legs, the bottom of the legs being darker. Um, I've not put the blazes and things onto the horses yet, but I have now, you know, I, I just said, I'm not even going to touch the riders or anything until I've got all the horses done. So I, I did all the horses, based them all up, did all the straps, put a load of different washes on them using the army painter, dark wash on the lower part of the body and the lighter sort of, not watered down, but, um, but watered down using army painter, um thinner or whatever it's called um medium to water down the top ones just to really have this huge achievement of horses and i'm now s sat here looking at i think it's um whoever it is i'm now sat here looking at um seven by four which is 28 bases <laughs> of two and three to a base horses um and i've even gone which i've, I've been too lazy to do with a lot of stuff i've actually got some wood filler and I built up the bases before I'm going to do them with the sand and the wood stain and the dry brush, but I've actually built up the bases to cover the little um, metal bases on the horses um, so that I can just do a more even layer of sand. Cause I think for a lot of stuff recently, I've just stuck the, the sand on and then tried to hide the metal base of the figure with static grass. But these ones I thought, cause I'm doing it and it actually looks all right, but but the weirdest bit is actually starting doing the the riders and realizing that Essex are actually really quite good because um, these Hungarian figures there's not there's maybe not quite enough variety but but I think there's four or five different packets that I've got that I'm just all mixing up because it's just kind of generic Hungarian horse but they're super simple figures to paint um, they all seem to be wearing a long coat which is great. There's not too many belts and, and other things around them. So they're wearing a long coat. Their trousers are a different color. Um, there's not too many other kind of complicated bits to it. So I've actually, this weekend, made a real, a much bigger dent than I thought I would do in in the riders. And and the great thing, about, one of the other great things about these riders is they don't necessarily appear to have a belt around their coat. And I always find just doing that tiny little belt is such a, you know steady hand thing when you're you're close to it so i think these hungarians could be they could be done in another if not by this time next week but but certainly by this time the week after and and it's only really a question well certainly the mounted would be i don't think the foot will take that long and i, I just need to look at whether i need to get a few more or i should get a few more um gendarme type um knight cavalry you know, heavy night people to go with it because I've only got four of those and I think the army list has six and they're quite distinctive 
um, with shields and stuff. They're quite distinctive East European look. So, you know, I, I, I might put in my first order to Essex in, in as long as I can remember. Um, it's, it's just kind of a very weird thing to go nice, simple to paint, solid figures that, that just get done quite quickly. Um, Looks at the Bowman then yet, yeah, have you? Yeah, the Bowman, I, I have squirt <laughs> on those infantry Bowman and they look a little bit all over the shop. I can't even work out what they're wearing. They've got um, all sorts of plumes and stuff. They're quite a complicated figure. They're quite a nice figure. Yeah, I was trying to work out those Hungarian bowmen. Are they wearing like some sort of padded body armour or something around the middle? I can't or... remember. There's a lot on them. Um, they're, they're, they're exactly out of the WRG book. They're actually like almost identical. Okay, because the, inf the infantry spearmen look, even though there's two different lengths of spear, they look really simple. I've not looked at the spearmen. I've, I've bought some of the Hungarian bowmen to use for my Hussite army for the life. Yeah, th yeah, they're a bit, they're a bit skinny. They're a bit of an odd mess, really, the, the bowmen. But, but I think I only there's not that many bowmen because I thought it would be an army that would have rear rank shooters, but it isn't, is it? It's um, mm, nice. it just blocks the spearmen and then a couple of units of bow. So, so it's I think, bow, isn't it? Yeah, there's just some foot like foot bow. So I think I've got enough for those. I've just got to steal it. But I think these cavalry could be done, and and I've kind of gone with a palette of of green and red and white as much as I can. Um, to give them kind of a Hungarian vibe. Um, and I'm just about to try printing off loads and loads of little shield stickers to see if I can, well, not stickers, but um, little shield patterns on, on white paper to see whether I can actually make that theory work, um, and as well as all the banners as well. And I think it would be an army with a lot of banners on it. Yeah. So, you're, going to, you're going to try and do some of the tiger um, coats on the hazards? Um, I'm not sure because this the army has Serbian uh, the elite Serbian hussars, doesn't it? In it, but I think the tiger coat isn't that like a later thing. Um, yeah, but um, I know some people do with do the um, sorry or, or the Hungarian nobles they put the, the tiger ones on though. It's just because they can do. Yeah, I think when, if it, if it's people who do it just because they can, that probably means I can't. Okay, um, it may be beyond me, but they the, the nobles look very much like. You know, proper proper gendarme figures but with a slight mm. east european kind of tinge to it but was the later army called the black army because they wore blackened arm armor is is that a thing or was that they were definitely called the black expression. army they were definitely yeah, called the black um, army but wasn't it corvinus yeah matthew yeah. corvinus but he was corvinus is the crow and his coat of arms is a crow so there may have been a a kind of a, a black thing there but, but yeah. i think if so you get um, if, if cheating so i'm looking at the army book so yeah. his son um, uh, matthias corvinus reigned from 1458 to 1490 he also raised an army of mercenaries called the black army um who defeated the turks at the battle of redfield right and also method wasn't uh, corvinus also in some of the underworld vampire movies yes <laughs> Okay, so you're saying I need to paint him up as Wesley Snipes, is that it? Or, or um, um, uh, Kate Beckinsale. Kate Beckinsale, Kate Beckinsale yes, Beckinsale. definitely with the title well, of the paint. I need to paint him as Kate Beckinsale. But, uh, right, okay. Well, Vinus was Bill Nye. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Wasn't that some guy who had a base where every time he threw a wand, he would uh, crucify his dice in his right. hunger? Wasn't, wasn't that a Moldovian army or something? Yeah, he, he would drill a hole in the dice and put it on a spike on his cap. it. Wow. Every time you throw one, you get through a lot of dice and you'd have yeah, a lot if, of dice. If Clive dice. did that, we'd have a big pile What's of dice. Wallach Wallachian or Transylvanian army? Yeah, that's it. It's a bunch of Dracula army. It's got to be one of those. I don't know who it was, but I heard about the story. It's got one of those. Then I actually did the weird thing of, um, well, we'll talk about it in a minute, but I, I did the weird thing of actually playing with the army online as well, which was kind of weird. But, but yeah, so I'm now staring at a whole horde of colourful-ish horses ready to have banners and, and shields and stuff on it. And, and that's really taken up all the time. There's been no, bizarrely, no distraction projects this week at all. It's um, even some, um, I think I've got some of those weird Balkan, yeah, yeah, Ottoman, Javelinman people that I picked up from um, Bowada, one of their ranges before they started doing lots of foot ranges to be like, like Javelinman for a um, Ottoman army. And even they haven't tempted me. I've just been, oh my God, I can actually do horses properly. Let's um, let's focus on that. So that's been my thing. This means war. This means war. So Adam, it 
looks like you're literally making tanks as we speak. What about you? Um, at the moment, making tanks, but I spent all week um, painting those Mongol step foot figures, um, which I'm quite pleased because there was 24, um, and I've got them all done. I put the um, slop, the what's it called? What, army the painter. Slop, yes, the yeah. army painter slop on today, yeah. um, which for me is actually quite fast. Um, so that that was quite pleasing. Um, sticking them together, the box from Fireforge is quite interesting because you get 24, but and there's three different tro troop types. You get bows, you get chaps with small round shields, and you get chaps with big wicker shields, like almost like sparrow barrow. Um, but the box comes with they come with sort of like legs and legs, body, separate head, separate body, separate head, separate arms, and you stick them all together in the poses you want, and it's all done quite well and it's it's well done apart from and i've never really done plastic figures before trying to match up chaps with bows with the right angled body because you want this different angle to people that are walking forwards with spears so you had to be kind of careful um what body you gave what arms and what what weapons otherwise you would have someone trying to shoot a bow and his legs would be pointing off in the wrong direction but, um, yeah, because normally most of the other ones I've seen have got the torso and the legs together. And then, certainly the Perry ones, the torso and the legs are a single piece. And you okay. get a separate head and then then separate arms. And then mm -hmm. gripping, gripping, gripping beasts. Base, it's, it's got torso and legs. Torso, More... legs, and sometimes an arm, isn't it? I think the, the archers from Gripping Beast, the arm comes with it. It's just part of the torso. Certainly the Romans. Um, I think um, so. Is it possible with those twenty-four to make? Do you have to make like eight, eight, and eight, or can you? No, no. They, 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 there's loads of bits in there, um, right. so you can more or less do what. And I did do eight, eight, and eight because it's for Saga, and it was they were all different. Those right. There's yeah. loads of bits in there, but I'd say you could sort of like do them all spear or all bow or all sword. Apart from some of the torsos and the way they were twisting with sort of like. Because bowmen, you tend to want side on. Yeah. Um, and people's spears, not so much side on. Um, yeah. So you could, and some of the bowmen, for instance, I did um, to get, oh, I actually got 12 bow and 12 of the other ones. But I had to do some walking forward, holding their bow right. quite rigidly in their arm rather than reloading or something, which was, um, but they're okay. They were good. Um, um, and I would recommend them. Um, but um, I've got them all done because the other thing I realised is last week you said that at the moment we've got more time for painting. I've realised at the moment I've got less time for painting. Right. Because, because it's even though I'm furloughed, hmm. so um, I'm at home all day, um, I'm doing childcare all day, so I can't really paint. And then where I've got two kids that don't go to school, bedtime's just kind of gone out the window. Oh, so tricky, yeah. I can only paint in the evening, and the evening is a lot shorter than it used to be before the lockdown. So um, I'm yeah. actually painting. I've got less time to paint, which is uh, vaguely annoying. Oh, that's frustrating. Uh, nightmare. Well. Yeah, well, I guess, um, but you did a couple of weeks ago that you dragooned the kids into doing some of your painting for you, hadn't you? So has that run <laughs> well, out? Painting for them. Well, no, painting for them, and they're still doing them, and they're going to be playing games with them. But right. it's... Uh, um, my, my standard of painting isn't great, but it's still slightly better than slightly better than your small kids. With. Yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Well, look, that's a good roundup then. We've all um, we've all got on with something. We've done twenty eight mil, fifteen mil scenery, ancients, dark ages, all the rest of it, and um, whatever whatever it was that Simon's War or Spanish Succession, no, Seven Years War, something. Seven like Years that. War. So there's been all sorts of things going on then. This means war. Right, so what do we have next? Um, I attempt to do our new thing. I'm going to try and find a new bit of music for this, which will work. 1812? I don't know. Look, we'll, we'll, ask, we'll ask that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> see if I can get a copy of that. <laughs> So this is a new feature then, um, which we're experimenting on. 
um, it's it's going to be a learning experience in in every sense of that phrase. So as I'm sure you remember, or, or if you're a new listener, please go back and listen to some from a while ago. This epic um, 10 mil Napoleonic army that I cobbled together because it was an entirely different scale to anything anyone else in the club had, and that's the law with Napoleonic to play or we'll try and play Battle Empire. So I, and this is my first ever Napoleonic set of troops of any shape or, or form whatsoever. And, and with all the different bits of history, you know, I've done Ancients, I've done Renaissance, I've done World War II, World War um, Modern Stuff, Ultra Modern, even bits and bobs of sci-fi, Dark Ages. But, but the Napoleonic uh, American Civil War, um, definitely there. just look at some of the other stuff around the room. Really is. But, um, other other things as well, but but Napoleonic's is just that big legendary period that's kind of passed me by somehow in through actually through sheer bloody mindedness most of the time um, in in my wargaming career. But now there's a set of rules that people may well play. Um, I've got some ten mil figures which are quite cute. I'm pretending I'm not going to buy the British or the Austrians or any other country just yet until I've done two more other armies to these Hungarians um, but but it suddenly it struck me that um, I actually know nothing at all literally nothing at all about Napoleonic Wars other than I think one side wore blue um, and the other white side wore red and Sean Bean says bastard a lot in a northern accent um, in Spain somewhere and and I think that the Spain bit there is the the book um, Jonathan Norrell and Mr Strange is it? Um, oh, that's the, a good book. Which is a great that, that fantasy book. Which so that I think is my sum total of um, of historical knowledge of the Napoleonic Wars. But I think we've got some people on this podcast who undoubtedly know more than me, even though it's setting a fairly low bar, to be honest. But but we're going to try and see if I'm, I can be educated in this new feature to in a series of, of weekly episodes. Which if there's any value to it, we might even. Um, carve out and release as a standalone set as well at some point of trying to learn what the hell the napoleonic wars was about um from from ground zero and and i think i suspect there's going to be quite a lot of andy in this one and quite a bit of dave um and, and possibly a bit of simon uh, as, as well possibly in that order no maybe not and um <laughs> Just to start with then, making the um, entirely correct assumption that I know absolutely nothing. Um, Napoleonic Wars, was it just like some short French bloke got out of bed one day and said, let's have a go at invading Europe. And, and then it all kind of kicked off. When did it start? Why did it start? What was the, what was the build up to war um, that suddenly turned all this thing in? Wasn't it um, um, England tried to call Greg's a, a, a patisserie and so he decided to have a, start a fight? That's, um, that, that, that's the Australian version of history, Simon. It, uh, the, the received version in these parts of the world is a slightly different um, story. Um, according to a, an author I read a little while ago, the most important event of the 18th century was that a French officer called uh, William de Jumonville got his head smashed in by a bloke with a tomahawk in... 1754 and through a series of causation that ultimately led to the american revolution and then to the french revolution the french revolution started brief uh, roughly to some idea a bit like the english civil war in the king ran out of money and the parliament said unless you change your ways we're not going to give you any more and uh, kings threw a hissy fit and there was ultimately an overthrow of government the um monarchies of france thought this is not of Europe thought this is not a good idea because if other people think they can get rid of their monarchs they might try it on us so we better put this down and invaded France that was the oh, start of the revolutionary right. okay. wars so, so in, in terms of my historical thing because that's something I've not even really clocked that so the Napoleonic Wars happened started fairly soon after the events in the film um carry on don't lose your head don't lose your head well which, even at the same time that's right yes in which Sir um, James I mean, was they, the they, um, they, they although there's a careful there. It's not yet the Napoleonic Wars. It's okay. a revolutionary war. You're, wars, you're in the revolutionary okay. wars at the moment. It's not okay. Napoleonic yet because the uh, man with the hat hasn't turned up yet. Right. So there's so there's well, Sid has, James. So there's Sid, but not there's, as a leader. So there's Sid James running around France with the black spot or something like that, and Hattie Jakes is probably involved, and there's the guillotine, and and all those people who are going to do that really 
successful musical that uh, is just kind of miserable and it's got things in barricades and um and no that, that, that no you get your timelines a bit mixed my time up has gone wrong, what happens it? a bit later but um so, so we've got people you've got the revolutionary the wars right but, so um, they cut and, off the heads of all the royalty yeah so a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the army was um the, Robes, most Robes, of the people yeah ropes pierre is that yeah he was he, he was a, he was a revolutionary nutter but there were quite a few around at the time so, okay um the um most but most of the professional army officers in the french army were uh, aristocratic and uh, after the revolution they either headed off or were headed off aha um, their heads were off um and then you had a bit of a brain drain in the french army so you had nobody to lead it so basically it became to some extent a meritocracy and you got people who knew what they were doing got promoted through talent and that's how napoleon came to prominence as long as Along, along with along with a lot of the guys who ultimately became marshals what, um, doesn't, when he became if, um, you know if if you're a country and suddenly you've got like this this big revolution of, of the people taking over and chopping their heads off all the, the nobility yeah how does how does the military carry on so, well what what's what's driving the french military to need a meritocratic meritocratic leadership you know, management model. Well, they need somebody to run. They need people to lead the armies. You see, were well, they and always at risk of being invaded by everybody anyway? Yes, because um, Prussia and Austria invaded in 1792, and the and the French army had to stop it. Now, um, it, you know, they were obviously outnumbered, and they called lots of enthusiastic peasants to the colours. But of course, these guys weren't drilled. Um, most of them weren't armed. A lot of them weren't even properly dressed, and um, that French led really to guessed. the initial division between what's known as the blues and the whites the whites being the traditional regiments who could march in line and shoot their muskets and the blues being the hordes of peasants who would just charge at the enemy they'd lose half of them but so, so the, what they're really so this is anyway. kind of like um a revolutionary version of um the the foundation of israel in that someone goes tada we're a new country and then the neighbors invade them because they're just not really keen on that so so the prussians and the other guys were the Whoever the other one, the, the, the Austrians. Believe, yeah. Austrians. Yeah. The, I can't believe they're not uh, Germans. The Russians as well. Um, no, I don't think Russians got involved to begin no, with. Not until later. So they all pile in to yeah. try and. Did they like have a, you know, a king in waiting, or were they just want to take it over? Yeah, but their, well, there were um, families. But the the, um, I think the king. There were some Aristos who would have. They would have put somebody on the throne from. Someone the old would have dynasty. put the hand forward for the job, wouldn't they? I guess. Yeah, um, but basically they were seen off the Battle of Valmy and that kind of saved France. And then the wars where's, continued. Where's Valmy? Is that near? Somewhere in eastern France. Right, okay. Northeast of Paris. Northeast yeah. of Paris. And that was 1792. So if you're coming from Austria, how do you end up there? You were coming, it was a Prussian army coming from the Low Countries, advancing on Paris. Right. So the Prussians were in the Low Countries, so the Prussians were Dutch. Well, if you start off in Prussia and you go into Paris, have a look at the map. Right, okay. So Prussia, where is Prussia then? Because it's not there anymore, is Prussia, it? Um, I, Prussia, Prussia, at that point, was in two around places. Around in two places, of course. Yeah. Well, like it's you had East Prussia, East Prussia, which is in, which was pretty much Poland and Lithuania. Okay. Well, it's, now, it's now Russia, really, isn't it? Kaliningrad and stuff, yeah. Yes. Have you ever yeah, enjoyed uh, a verse in Berlin? Uh, Brandenburg, Prussia. Yes, yes, verse. Yes. You were in Prussia. North, East okay. Germany. Right. So Berlin. There's Berlin, those people with the sausages and the pointy hats and things like that, they all had a go. The Austrians came and helped them. The French stopped them somewhere through sheer revolutionary fervour and some old posh people who could march in line who had not got their heads cut off. And then the French end up with a meritocratic army as a result. It did take some time, but the, the, the um, wars became more general and basically by about the mid uh, 1790s, uh, it was basically a, a became a, a turf war for Central Europe mainly. Um, so who else piled in? Did you, but were they well, just... various, you see, various, you've got all these various coalitions and various times there was different people involved. Now, Napoleon was an artillery captain. Uh, and he now, came... now, I'm just wondering if, if the arrival of Napoleon might, now I'm understanding this, so might be the point to to say this is our, our first tranche, because it sounds like there's a lot happened. So we've, if I'm going back, so we've got French Revolution, Bosch, everybody the lose their heads. Period about the French states, the new French Republic surviving the period of its initial instigation, decapitation of the king, yep. revolutionary fervor, 
the first section is where everybody else, all the other kings in Europe go, we're not having this. Right. English funding it. The Austrians, the Prussians, and everybody else are supplying the soldiers. And the, the French survive in Northern Italy. Then they start to go slightly more on the offensive in Italy against the Austrians. I'll hand back to Andy. So the Austrians are in Italy then, right? Yes. So, we've got, so we've got the French state, it's been invaded by some Austrians and some Prussians who want to change a king. And then the Austrians and Prussians, it all goes a bit wrong. And then there's some French in that northern bit of Italy that speaks at Savoy. Yeah, that happens a bit later like on. Yeah, if, if that, we, that's their survival yeah. period, but then they start to go more on the offensive in Italy against the Austrians. Yeah. Tim, the Austrian... in answer to your question, who joins in, basically everyone does. Yes. Everybody. But the, was there, the was French there... Republic says, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Everybody thinks they're hard enough and it <laughs> kicks off all over the place. <laughs> but uh, did, was there a point at which, being sort of vaguely technical, that they, those everybody having a go were going, because we want to restore a monarchy in France and of course it'll be favourable to us because that's the way this sort of thing sort of works. Yeah. Did it suddenly turn into, actually, they're on their knees, let's just have a bit of it. Um, and let's nick some of it. Well, no, it, it started off with restore the monarchy and it turned yeah. into the Republic kind of winning. So the Republic thinking, we'll have some of this. Let's see what we can grab. Okay. Going forwards forwards rather than being defensive. So, so we've got the Prussians, the Austrians, they're in a bit of a go. And then who else is nearby? What, the Dutch, the Spanish? Is that a thing? Yeah, the, yeah, the British. The British. Yeah. Where are the so, and we're well, up to what, what, what well, sort of it, what year are we up to? We're here? kind of 1793, 1794. This is where Napoleon comes to prominence because exactly. the British support a um, royalist attack on the port of Toulon, which is where the French navy is. And, and the British, that's in the south of France, then, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so the British turn up there with, with a force to try and besiege, uh, take Toulon. You know, well, is, this, is this a land can. warfare or is this naval stuff? An amphibious it's invasion, land. right? An amphibious invasion of Toulon by the British in 1793. Yeah. Supported really? by local royalists. Yeah. But where did what did they just sail from Portsmouth in a load of ships that's and stuff? Sean Bean in it. He's actually no, that's the other one, not Sean Bean. It's the other one. The um, Bond Bond Yeah, Bond the Zachary Peck. So, so Peck they sail Peck. from Portsmouth, let's say, all the way round through um, Gibraltar, and then up to Toulon to think. Probably Toulon is the obvious place to invade. Yeah. Um, and we'll start there. And by the and time they get there, there's some French people there waiting for them. Well, they, they managed to take the port, and then the French managed to hem them in. Uh, and then Did they get down there on the TGV by then? I guess they've got internal supply lines, and it's much quicker. Uh, yeah, that's Possibly. probably the case. Yeah. Yeah. So they um, so the, 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 there's a siege, and it's not going anywhere because they can't starve the British out because the British have got sea supply. Right. So um, Napoleon uh, is is at this stage an artillery captain, and fairly mm. low down the uh, food chain. Um, but he managed to get himself put in charge of all the artillery guns at Toulon and finds ways of putting them in clever places to start shooting at the British ships and the Brits don't like that and ultimately he calls the Brits to cause the Brits to clear off and then they promote him to brigadier and sort of start taking notes of what he says okay and after that there was a attempted revolution in counter-revolution in France in 1794 and Napoleon sorted that out uh, by firing his cannons at the revolutionary people in Paris Please. and then they gave him a, a, an army command in Italy that yeah. and that sounds like a perfect place to um to end this first episode then so we've yeah. got we've got the whole origination of the war it actually starts with with Sid James and and cutting people's heads off and that's all good and then by the end of that we've got Napoleon with a big battery which is another thing that I do know already about the Napoleonic Wars um and he's suddenly been promoted in a so I now understand why it became a meritocratic army. Um, I'm still slightly hazy on why Toulon would be the chosen point of invasion for the Because British. you've got some ships you can nick if you're the Royal Navy. You think, oh, here's a French fleet. It's not very well defended. We'll have some of that. I believe there was also a royalist uprising there that they went yeah. to the port. Yeah, there was sort of... Yeah. The who was the British, king, who was the British king at this time? Or who was running oh, for George it? George III. George yeah. III. And, and, okay. and, and it, it was like, William Pitt that was running the country. William Pitt, the younger or the elder? Younger, younger I think. Younger. Okay, that's it. Fantastic. So, um, and just one qu final thing. So we talked about the British, the Prussians, the Austrians, um, other people. Was there anyone else significant? Spanish, Sardinians. Spanish, Portuguese. 
Portuguese, Portuguese. Uh, various German states, by Russia. So Germany wasn't even a country by then. It was no, just definitely not. It was it was about thirty nine different princedoms, I think. Okay. Württemberg, Saxony, and Bavaria. that's why there's so many flags. Yeah, yeah. There's loads and loads of miniature little German states. Württemberg, Brunswick, Baden, 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 Baden. Okay. Yeah. And it's still at the end of the Thirty Years' War, and a bit of a continuation of that. Right. And so, does that mean the Swedes and the Danes and stuff, or were they just exhausted and they didn't bother? That's another story. Okay, we'll yeah. come to that another week. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much. A very interesting first episode. <laughs>
bullet sort of like opens up the flank quite quickly. Um, and if it's facing a lot more mounted troops, um, it's actually not too bad at slowing it down because the two heavy spear bow can kind of stand there um, and again, not be too scared. Um, and the cavalry's job is to make sure the enemy don't quickly get onto the flank. No, I, so, I, do, li I do like those, um, those heavy spear bow units in combination with cavalry because they are just being heavy infantry. They are just tougher than, than any cavalry. And I think in this period, you're right, there's a lot of, there's a lot of mounted armies and you're putting out an awful lot of shooting there. You've got like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You've got sixteen shooting units. No, actually, no, eighteen. Eighteen shooting units out of twenty. So that's mm -hmm. a lot of, lot of arrows, a lot of javelins going in in, in anybody's direction. Um, and you've gone straight, brilliant, all the way through for the generals as well, which is a lot well, of command points. But it did because I went with that because. I started off and what I tend to do with armies is I put each general down as competent just to put something in and then I can go up and down from there. So you mm. can either save points or spend points from there. But when I did the army with all these units, so it looked like this, it came to exactly 191 points. And I thought, oh, what shall I do with the re remaining nine points? And I could get something like a medium cav bow. Um, or I could get three brilliant generals to make sure I always had the command points to do what I wanted to do. And I couldn't see anything better to do with them those nine points than do it. Because the two mixed commands, one there's foot and there's mounted, so they, they kind of need, always need separate points. And the uh, bigger command, the, the skirmishes are kind of like a separate unit as well. So... Um, for the initiative and trying to make sure you attack and for the always just not running out of pips nine points of i actually thought was a bargain compared to what else i could spend the points on yeah because that's one of the things we talked about peter's list last week or you know my my criticism of it was that possibly the command was a bit light to move the heavy foot up with the with the mounted but with with brilliant generals with all of those you've got a good a good chance of pushing them forward um i guess it's whether it's whether it's grunty enough to really take on, you know, anybody else's proper foot, um, but with just those two Varangians as the real proper combat troops, do you do you see that command in the middle as being one that holds back and you're pushing on the sides, or or are they just pushing up along the line and doing, you know, is is there a standard deployment for it? Maybe that's the question. Well, there's there's I suppose there's two standard deployments against a mainly mounted army. Um, the that the foot command goes in the middle and you just push forward and shoot. Um, and I think any opponent's mounted army is going to struggle because it's just going to be an arrow storm. And they can't even ride through the arrow storm and ride me down because of the heavy spear. So against a mounted army, it would be. Against a predominantly foot command, um, maybe the same bit that holds back while I try to pick apart the flanks. Or even if there's, uh, if I can get a steep hill on a flank, um, the foot command goes on the side with the jabs on the steep hill and holds back, while the two commands with the four elite cavalry um, try Work to pick together. it up flank and roll it up, or even um, with the um, with all the with all the uh, command points that elite cavalry you can sort of like try and shove it into a weak bit of the enemy foot line because there's always it's not going to be sort of like really really solid solid so you get the choice of either putting them in a place you want to be where they can ride through or getting them together so they can gang up and ride around. But against a predominantly fit army, this army will struggle more than against yeah. a mounted army, but that was, that's just going to be the case. Right. Dave, you're, I think this is an army you're looking at, or oh, you've looked at a few times, isn't it, or played with. What, are, you, um, are you scratching your head looking at this one or just going nodding or...? I think um, I'd say Adam remembers watching me getting thumped by somebody in Bournemouth who used a lot of the scutar toy. So I think, subconsciously, that might be a thing. Yeah, yeah against. I, yeah. So I, I, th I think what I, the, the light foot javelin and the light foot bow holding down a wing of difficult terrain is a brilliant idea. I see that as being um, Clive's trick, actually. Clive uses the Byzantine army. That's what he does. He has like a wood, a, a forest, okay. put like an ambush of the javelin men and the light foot in there, and you'll never get through that. It's that so that can hold down one wing. 
Um, my, I mean, I think my only, my only criticism, if there is any, I mean, I like the idea of having the heavy cavalry impact bow elite working with the Scutatoi. I would treat the Scutatoi as bowmen to shoot. So against a mounted army, I think this is very, very good. I would probably downpower the generals as slightly and take more of the tagmatic heavy cavalry. But, and that's a fair comment, and I sort of like try to do them sums, yeah. but if I downpower them all to competent, I get nine points. That's not even yeah. one tagmatic cavalry. It, it is an expensive army, and the, and the tagmatic cavalry are, are expensive troops. And but to buy, that's, that's, taking them down to ordinary, um, you would really struggle commanding these commands with extraordinary generals. Um, well, Adam, what you, could, what you could do, Adam, is if you uh, reduce the generals by each and take away one of the Scutatoi, you can get um, an elite cavalry and a light infantry unit, so you actually get more units. Is there any more light infantry allowed, though, or is it maximum Yeah, you can three? have up to three of these. You can have more, you can have more bow or sling. More light infantry, bow and sling. You can, have eight, you can have eight light infantry altogether if you wanted. All oh, the famous staff slingers, I guess they would be, wouldn't they? That classic, that classic figure from 6th edition days that seems to have disappeared. Okay. All right, well, look, I think, Simon, we will... Um, we will, we will unmute you and come to you next on your your version of this, um, which is which is different but similar, I guess. Um, so talk us talk us through. You've got one less unit. You've got one less initiative, um, which is a, a slightly odd mix. Um, your, your generals are slightly downgraded, which means you must have some pokey pokey stuff there. But talk us through your your thought process on this one. So when I was looking when I was looking through the army list, I was thinking what would be the pretty troops to use in this army and what would deliver a great big punch in period. So I thought, start with the uh, Scutatoi in the middle as the, uh, you know, just a bit of a foot soccer command. So you've got four of those, the heavy spear bowmen, and they get shielded by some of the light foot. So they can just wander around and, and annoy people. But then on both flanks, you've got two quite tough mounted mounted wings so on one flank you've got four of the heavy cavalry the uh, tagmati or tagmatic cavalry they're all all elite heavy cavalry impact bow so they're going they're going to annoy anybody mm. with a brilliant general and they've got a light cavalry to go as well so you've got um that one unit is six wide everything shoots uh, four of which which are elite and then on the other flank You've got uh, two more of the Tegmatic Cavalry, uh, again being elite and another light horse. But just to line it up with the infantry, because then you, you can see other people would have heavy infantry armies in this period, I put two of the big cataphra elite cataphracts in there as well, just to, if someone does park a, an infantry unit in front of you, like a heavy swordsman, so something along those lines, you can um, introduce them to a cataphract and, and see how, how things go. So um, that was the, the uh, a simple thought of everything in the army, other than other than the two cataphracts, shoots. Yeah. And um, pretty... any light foot who come up to annoy the heavy spearmen, which some people might do, um, you've got enough light skirmishes to, to go and deal with them. Or if you get like you know, Adam was saying, like a forest or a a a hill, you know, a gentle hill with a, a field on top of it. You could park four light infantry inside that. Four wide is going to give you a fair bit of um, coverage as well. You've got, you know, 19 element wide army of which almost everything shoots. So it could annoy someone or I could be packing up and going to the pub very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's got a very, it, it's got a very similar mix of troops to, to Adam's one. I guess the, the cataphract toy um the cataphracts they do the same thing they fulfill the same function as the as the varangians in a slightly different way you know they're, mm. they're similar sort of points they they can take on infantry but they're probably a little bit well a little bit better against most most imperial mounted being elite um and then that just gives you four um highly mobile well four mobile punchy troops on each flank whereas adam had had two punchy troops and two slightly slower shooty troops on on each flank, but then your your centre is is just doesn't have the staying power. I, I guess is this a because you no you're you're in the process of painting up Chinese troops, but 
I'm just wondering if these um, heavy spearmen and bowmen is a troop type you've used in medieval armies and stuff, or have you seen? Yeah, them? I've been on the receiving end of heavy spear, heavy spear uh, bowmen or pikemen bowmen, and they're one of those troop types where, when they work, they are brilliant. But when they don't work, all you do is swear about them. So I remember at warfare last year, I ran up against a one of the Burgundian French armies. So you had this combination of heavy spear bowmen, a long bowmen, and I just could not get into these things. You know, they all they did was outshoot me, outdice me, beat me, and took apart my entire flanks. Yeah, other times I've seen them. You know, you you charge them with a knight or a heavy cavalry impact. You hit them because they're mediocre and melee. You go through them in turn one. You pop out the other side. Go well. That was interesting. So, um, yeah, because I, 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 I played them. Um, I think the last time we we're in Patras, they had a themed competition. There was quite a few people who had had these Nikephorian sort of Byzantine armies, and mm. and I I think I had the Gaznavids at the time, and and basically whenever I saw a block of Scutatoi, I just thought that's a target for the Death Star, mm. and and I'll let the one or two you know light tree in front of it get shot to bits and then the Death Star will hit it and I'll just take them off the table. So it just became a real real target and it was it was a struggle for people to get the the cavalry in. But um but I guess you've got more more poke on the outside to to squeeze that in, but but you're trading off that central command having a little bit less staying power. Yeah, because I, I did look at the um the Russian ally that um, Adam went for to have the two heavy swordsmen as well. Because um, I'm a big fan of a guy with a big sword walking around with the spearmen going, if you if you're yeah, hard they're enough. Mercenaries, aren't they? Not not an ally, but they're mercenaries. Yeah. Oh, sorry. In, yeah. In, integral integral yeah. uh, mercenaries and all that, yeah. and um, they're quite quite cool. But again, as um, Adam was saying, this is one of those armies where you just don't get enough points. Yeah. And we have seen a few of them, like um, the Ottoman Turks are, are as well. At 200 points there, eh, they're not bad. You know, you've got to work really hard at them. But at 300 points, they really sing. And we've seen some armies where at 300 points, they work really well. And other ones just don't work any better because you just get a few more units. Yeah. And, or meh. Yeah, so... Um, um, hmm. All right, Dave, any... You know, again, you're... You were talking about Patras. In Patras, I, we saw... You know, I think the, the Greek players we play use this a lot. It's a very favourite army of that period. Yeah. It's one of my favourite armies in historical terms. I mean, they quite off, quite a few of them use the Russian ally, an actual ally. Yeah. So that was cheap, and that was the go forward in the centre to pin. I mean, it doesn't kick out so much shooting, but it saved you points. I like Simon's list because there's six of the tactic cavalry who are brilliant. I think I'd probably... The cataphracts are really good to support the scutar toy, but I think I'd drop the cataphracts and go, I'd, I'd even probably take a couple of medium cavalry bow to work with the tagmatic. So just mass the cavalry shooting in that way. Okay. Yeah. I've, I was... I've, got a, I've, I've got a dislike of the scutar toy. I think the scutar toy work if they're massed and you treat them as bowmen. Uh, but, but this list has got them a bit more massed, hasn't it? Because I, I, I don't know, I, I find that um, maybe it's just the experience of using those sort of pseudo scutato in the Gaznavid list. That the times I've found that a block of two or or three seems to be the optimum number, three puts out so much shooting that it makes it almost impossible for mounted to get in, and they can really really support your mounted with a with creating a sort of you know twelve centimeter wide piece of mobile terrain that people don't even want to get near. Whereas two with just two dice shooting. You can mm. sort of have a go at them, but three seems to be the the magic number. But you know whether, whether you're using them in support, um, it's an interesting one. So these yeah, are... I've I've seen um, where I've seen armies where you've got just the two. You can pull them apart because you can always get around them. But I've seen some, especially some of the Chinese armies where you've got a, even if they're three in two commands and they work together as a tag team, all of a sudden you've got six wide potentially, and if you have a gap in the middle. You've got seven to eight wide of it shoots and it's reasonably tough in combat. It's a fair bit of a width on your table. You've lost, you, know, you can deny quite a lot of, the, t of the, t the table with that. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair shout, isn't it? Okay, all right. Well, look, I think let's, um, let's, let's 
flip these two back up on screen. So we've got, this is Simon's, um, and then, then we've got Adam's list here. So if I, if I run along the screen then, um, Andy, uh, what's your, your thoughts over to the two? Um, if you were, I, if I, you prefer, were I prefer Simon's list because I think the, um, firstly, having four tagmatic cavalry in one command makes them a good mounted attacking command. I don't think um, Adam's command is configured to attack anybody seriously because I think having, having, I don't think the Scutatoi are good for attacking people with. I don't think having only two cavalry per command gives you enough um for attacking. And what I like particularly about Simon's is, is, well, three things. Number one, in the center lot, you've got four Scutatoi. So even though they're not the best attacking troops, they, they dish out a lot of firepower to deter people who might otherwise want to attack them. Your four tagmatic cavalry will be a decent attacking option. I like the idea of having one shooty guy, foot guy with them to support them. And in the other one, I think the cataphracts can lean into the centre and support the infantry if they need to. And if not, they're no worse at hand-to-hand -hand combat than the medium cavalry bow, which uh, Dave was suggesting. So I'd, if I was to, somebody said, right, use one of these armies in a battle, I'd much prefer to use uh, Simon's list. All right, okay. Well, next up along, Tamsin, what's, um, what's your thoughts? This is Simon's, that's, that's Adam's. Okay. You know, mixed mixed opinions about about what I'd, I'd probably go some somewhere in between the two actually I think Simon Simon pushing the Simon's wing with with the four tagmatic cavalry is something which I would have in my list I might have had more might have dropped the scutato from that and had sort of more like I sort of from that way, that wing, and had two light horse, light cav there. I think in the centre on Simon's list, that's where it comes. I, I think I'm not sure four is going to g give enough, deny enough width. So I, I'd probably, I'd probably have a have a stronger infantry centre there, and maybe not have the cataphracts on the other one. So isn't, isn't that basically Adam's list? <laughs> Almost. Um, to make a stronger well, infantry centre, and well, well, one of the one of the wings, yeah. were, one of the cavalry wings, having more of the having more tagmatic cavalry, possibly drop the so if it looks at Adam's list, possibly drop the Varangians. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah, the, the, then you, I, that, then and that's starting to make it a very different thing, isn't it? I guess it's yeah. Which one of these two is is closer if you're if you're picking them? Because you know you've Simon's got, is closer. Simon's is closer. Okay, um, and because it's just got, because you're not you're not convinced by the Varangians, and you like that. Everybody seems to like well, that. I, Four tagmatic cavalry is the big, the big, mm. a big attraction. I think. Yeah, it's a hammer. I don't think it's a real hammer. It's, it's army. enough cavalry. It's enough oomph. It's enough there yeah. to be as I to be a, to be a significant threat. Okay, all right, Dave. You you on the the end of the line? What's your thinking? I take Adam's list because it's twenty and not nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> I think numbers is a bit of a key here um, and I like the I mean the three brilliant generals is really fascinating that could quite be quite fun yeah and, initiative uh, four is huge isn't it yeah yeah I, I, I mean basically I think you were going to set yourself up to maybe even defend in mountains there so you do get that pinning one wing down and go for lots of movement um, yeah I, I'd, I'd go for that yeah, I, I think um, again, it, it's such a because um, it's such a small list. You can you can get focused on wanting to make one or two changes, you know, or even one one unit change is still quite significant to do it. So I think that's possibly why you know, um, you know I'm sort of with you, Tamsin, in that it's not it's not quite there. I think I'm probably I'm probably with Adam's list to use it just because I like those blocks of Scutatoi um, with the cavalry, but I, I can't help looking at this and just thinking the ca there's just not quite like those two balance commands. There's maybe just too too many Scutatoi. Um, you know, I, I think if there was a way of, of making one of those commands for heavy cavalry impact bow um, and dropping the the two two scutato out of one of them, it would 
it would be doing one of the things we talked about last week about giving you a more obvious way of playing. So make one of them the going forward one, one of the supporting command, and then the command in the middle is that, that CNC's command with the Spearman and the Vrankins is absolutely fine. Um, but the problem there, Tim, is yeah. what you're getting into is it's yeah. better at 300 than 200. No, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, I think I'm still going with, I think I'm still going with your list. It's just, it's just because it's such a, the, the challenge of this list is you are really playing with small margins here. And, and normally with a lot of other lists, you go making one unit change, you know, it makes no odds. It's still the same. But I think with this one, because you're playing with so many small high quality pieces, you feel more compelled to think about swapping one of them out. But, but I think I would still, I would still end up going with, with Adam's list as well. So, so I think that was, that was me and you, Dave. Um, Tamsin, which one were you? You were. My, you know, Simon's is probably you were Simon's. my place. You were Simon's. So we don't have a tiebreaker in the form of Peter this week. Um, so that is a 50-50 a split straight down the middle. Fair, no. fair's fair. Excellent. All right, then, Simon. So um, you're the man on the computer this time. Um, can you go on to random.org, type it in, and then we'll, we'll see which list we come out of the 216. I'll do my keyboard effect now. List 194, Fatimid Egyptian. Fatimid Egyptian. That's a proper There's interest. There's a lot in that. Yeah, isn't there, right, Just It's got an entire page of things. Whoa. No, that's a proper list. Good pick. Yeah. Good pick from random.org. So, so let's have a look. So I've not had a go at this yet. And, and um, I think Andy no, and me. Tamsin. It's yeah. me and you, the Tamsin. Okay, Tamsin's volunteered. So, so myself and Tamsin will have a go next week on Fatimid Egyptian. And we can get the other five people taking a view on it. All right, something to look forward to. This means war. So this week then, um, as w something we started last week, some of us have actually drifted into some gaming. Now, um, which was a bit of a first, some of it was online, some of it was on tabletop. And I think it's fair to say that the, the advent of tabletop simulator has, has got some of us kind of, kind of keenly interested. Now, um, Peter's not here this week, but I did play a game against him earlier um this week as a bit of a test for it and and some of you guys sat in and, and we've really started to get the hang of moving units around and shoving them around on on tabletop simulator in in arts of the gear and then i think um so andy me and you played a game on a couple of days ago wasn't it i think it was on yesterday actually yes yeah, saturday there was, uh, was sunday sunday morning um yeah and this was your you'd had a kind of a browse of tabletop simulation a bit of messing around but this was the first first proper game so yeah. you know how did you how did you find it you know other than other it than sucked because i lost it sucked because <laughs> you lost okay no, no it was actually um well with, with your help in terms of the mechanics of moving things and having discovered the right way of wheeling troops uh, i think it worked reasonably well so apart from the tactile experience of moving bits of paper on the uh, you know bits of metal on the tabletop you've got essentially the experience of an ADLG game and what I was quite impressed was that um, we started what about 10 15 and finished by one so it wasn't that much longer than a than a real game even if you the full time yeah, learning learning interface I think we did about five or six turns before the one of the armies expired and yeah yeah and, and I think it was, things, yeah. it was it was the same as when I played Peter actually you you start off focusing on the mechanics of the tabletop computer game thing and then you just end up playing the game but um but I think yeah, learning learning how to wheel blocks of units quite simply was a real a real kind of game changer. And yeah. then you know, there's a few bits where the units bump into each other and, and knock each other over. Um, but but yeah, but as a game, it was it was interesting. So you had Carthaginian, um, yep. and it was a kind of I think it might have been was it the list that you talked about the other week when we talked yes, exactly. about, about Hannibal? Yeah, it was exactly that with a really solid elite you know elite and armored heavy infantry block in the middle. And then yeah. you had a, a Death Star on, as it turned out, on your left, Death Star Command. Death Star Light, basically, as it turned Death out. Death Star Light. And, um, and then quite a lot of elite cavalry on the, the right-hand side. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of matched off against the cavalry with, uh, with an Armenian ally, because I was taking Triumvirate Roman. Um, so I'd got, I think, three cataphracts and 
and a couple of medium cavalry, a couple of light horse on facing off against the cavalry command. My my centre was five legions, two elite, two ordinary, one mediocre, um, and a cavalryman just to faff around. And then my Death Star command up against yours, we had we had an, a mediocre elephant off, which Ooh, was a game of skill. quality, <laughs> proper quality. I think, I think at one point both of them were fighting each other, and both had enemy troops in their own flank. Yeah. Um, so whoever... yeah, I, 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 I cocked up because the light infantry I moved off to the flank was the one in front of the elephant, and I shouldn't have done that. I should have moved one of the other ones. Yeah, that left them a bit exposed. But I didn't, I didn't notice. I didn't notice it on the real tabletop, but on the computer, yeah. I, the penny didn't quite drop until it was too late when you started shooting at the thing. No, no, and then, um, and then I think there was a point at which um, these two elephants were fighting each other, and, and whatever happened in terms of elephant rampage, if either of them died there was a greater chance they damaged their own troops than there was that they turned no greater chance they damaged <laughs> the enemy than that they damaged their own troops there was so, yeah, so they, were both, they were both adjacent to, to two enemy units i think weren't yeah, they? both completely surrounded and um but i think in the end my my slightly bigger death star command i think i had two gladiators two um thracians yeah. and, a, and the theroperoi was just yeah. a bit wider than yours and and the gladiators struggled to fight their way through through your light javelin and in the difficult terrain, but eventually kind of ground them down and, and rolled yeah. it up. And and the the slog in the middle was a real slog between elite armoured infantry on on both sides, but but nothing really really happened quite quickly enough. And and I think those those three Armenian cataphracts got a bit into your infantry and then came back and had a little nibble at your cavalry. And then but it was really the Death Star command falling over that that tipped your yeah. army over the edge before mine in in that i think you're right there, yeah. yeah yeah that was it you see the, the beauty the, the thing hannibal in italy our option and uh, the advantage for your infantry for the carthaginians is firstly you can take it as impact rather than impetuous and secondly you can have um five of your five of your six front line infantry as armored yeah and that was super super tough it was um but i think we talked about it afterwards and i think you know they because they were fighting elite armoured legions, that was always going to be a battle that was going to last forever. And and you had the edge on it because you had more troops and, and they were better, but but it just it, they didn't get into combat quick enough and the flanks got into combat first. And by the time you were starting to get the upper hand in the middle, it the, the flanks had kind yeah, of... Yeah, things were happening over. elsewhere, which yeah. you know, changed the battle, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Adam, Can you, I just say... Yeah, go on. You've been sort of like talking about what happened in a game. You started off by saying, yeah, we tried this new online computer LDA, yeah. LDA the, the, the thing. Um, the way you were talking about the game, if I didn't know you were talking about playing it on the computer, I wouldn't have known, yeah. which is probably a good comment on how good the software setup is because you were just talking about it like you were playing it on the tabletop. Yeah. All the okay. computer does, it gives you the forum for playing it, essentially. And what I, you actually play, your moves and your die rolls and all the rest of it are done exactly the same as you would. Um, the computer doesn't do any of that apart from allows you to roll a die uh, and physically move the bits. But all the decisions you make and all the outcomes are based on not on computer programming, but what you would do if you're playing a face to face game. Yeah. And I, I think I don't know about you, Andy, but towards the end of the game or you know, it's my second game, you find that there's a few things in it which are actually almost better than the real game. <laughs> in some ways um i think i ended up first of all i started looking at the top down view much more often um rather than the isometric view because there's kind of 3d models of, of individual figures and things like that that you can look at which is lovely but then at some point you do kind of get into looking at it as a top down game which is is slightly a bit of a waste but but that's that's better and then there's a couple of tools on it there's one where you can measure exactly accurately the distance between two points so, you know, there's a few things where we go, and can they charge? And you just gra grab this tool that's part of the game and, and pull a line between the two corners of the units and go, no, that's slightly out, you know, mathematically. You, so. well, you didn't show me how to do that, but yes. No, I mean, obviously I not, but it was always out when you were trying and it was always just yeah. in when I was there. So it seems to work quite well. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, but one day, you know, we'll, we'll get around to that when it when it's useful for me. Yeah, you've you obviously had the program for the 13 inch ruler, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Slightly longer measurement sticks and things like that, <laughs> which, which I guess you could probably do if you wanted to cheat. Um, or slightly shorter. Or slightly smaller. Yeah. Pass one yeah, of those. The, ones. the bindi rule, ruler. Yeah, no, yeah. you're out. No. Using no you're, the, out. you're out. You're out. You're not in charge, right? You're not in. You're out. You're this out. one, I am. Yeah. <laughs> 
but I, I even managed to cobble together the um, the Armenian ally for the Roman army. So someone's made a Roman army, but, but I kind of nicked a few cataphracts and some cavalry from the Seleucid army and dropped them in as a, as an ally and saved. Did the you have ally. to make a separate saved item for that? As call it an yeah. ally corps. Yeah. 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 I, I made the ally corps as a separate thing and saved it as a um, as an Armenian ally because you know yeah. cataphracts are cataphracts and and cavalry with bow, cavalry with bow. So so it actually worked out fine. And I think you know. Doing it in in two and a half three hours is is pretty decent as well. Yeah, but, and I'm so, sure it'll speed up once we know what we're doing properly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I was part of me was thinking you could end up doing a competition on this, couldn't you? Um, okay, I think sitting in in a chair and staring at a screen is is enough for work, frankly. But um, I'm not sure I want to do that all weekend as well. <laughs> when um, there's the next epidemic, we're all kitted up. Yeah, the next step. When yeah, when the next wave comes, we're all going to be ready and we're going to have a another online competition but but i think it's definitely a winner definitely, definitely the, the winner. online world yeah the online world so um we'll be doing i, I can see myself that. buying that shortly buying it shortly no, it's like, i think it's like 15 quid 15 it, quid it, yeah it, it I know, works I mean, really really well i've just been lazy yeah it's a good one okay Look, so if I, I can work it it must be easy <laughs> so adam you normally um get in a game against the the wee minions in the house did you manage to do that this week or was there too I played much? two two different games one um wings of war or wings of glory whatever oh, it's called right. now, okay which again is um playing with children it's brilliant it's it makes them think three decisions and plan ahead and as a game i mean it's a really good lockdown game because it's a good just a good well-designed game that you can play with people that aren't into playing toy soldiers mm. you know, it's, yeah. it's a game you can play at christmas if your granny gets bored of board of cards against humanity you can yeah. get out <laughs> wings of glory and uh, play that so that's that's a really good fun game to play and the other one i played was a dungeon saga which is that's it's a about, like, yeah. mantic games it's mantic yeah mantic games and it's it's a board game where there's tiles and you put them down and you build a dungeon and sort of like one side plays the evil necromancer and the other side plays the four heroes so very sub D and D, but again, for playing with kids, uh, where they get to be on the same side, and I get to be the dungeon master, so kind of make sure they've got to work hard but win in the end. Yeah. Um, do, do they use some of the figures they painted up as as characters, or does it not need? Figures? Well, no, because the box came with all the characters you need, and I painted them them up quite a while ago because okay. they were quite quick and easy to paint. Um, so, and all the little sort of three D terrain of tables and stuff and doors I painted up, so it looks quite attractive. Um, and it, it's a good um, game because you can play it competitively. So one side plays the good guys, one's the dungeon questers, and the other side plays the uh, dungeon master. And you can play it as a competitive game, two players, or you can play it more as a traditional D and D type of setup, which is uh, what I did with children. Um, and we've been doing that off and on for a year or two, and we're slowly doing the scenarios until we get to the big last one. So that's uh, yeah, that's going quite well. Oh, that's quite cool. Okay. And Townsend, did you give did Dread another run out or were you very busy focused on actually building more terrain for them to hide behind? I was focusing on, focusing on terrain. Uh, so I haven't had a game this week. Uh, so I think of doing a, getting the gangster miniatures and terrain out tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So well, now you've got the fire hydrants, they've got something to, to crash their cars into. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually used cars in a game yet. Right, Except well, if you've got... If you've got Except fire hydrants, you have to, surely. That's the whole point. Knock them over. To Simon, did you have you given anything a, a go this time um, at all? Or no, just um, just painted my seven years war figures. That's as that's as far as I've got this week. Okay, well, I, I'm still waiting for that army list from you, Simon. Yeah, yeah, my head is hanging in shame. Yeah. Hey, look, <laughs> good year blimp. Good year blimp. It's all the way. Good. Well, look, we're all going to be going to car showrooms next week, so um, that will be the. That will take up all our time, won't it? Or something like that. That's like haircuts are going to be in order, though. Yeah. No, no, I think I'm I'm past that stage now. I'm I'm in a world of clippers. That's it. <laughs> I'll be um, looking. At you. I'll, I'll take your recommendations on clipper. I'm studying. Yeah. All. I'm, I, think, I'm, I think the only answer. I'm currently designing is, yeah, a new don't... game. I'm, I'm I'm designing a new scenario for a pandemic where the object of the game is you've got to get from London to Durham and back without being stopped by the police. <laughs> that could be that <laughs> scenario, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> grand okay. politics auto or something yeah grand politics <laughs> auto um right well good that's our gaming summary put up this means war and 
Um, and that inevitably, now we've done the gaming summary, brings us to the musical highlight, depending on, um, well, possibly the, the top two musical highlight, depending on what kind of music I managed to cook up for, for our Napoleonic section, um, of Andy's Quiz. Where, where did you find that music? Because it's brilliant. <laughs> it was some online, you know, rights free music, and I. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good, isn't it? Send me the whole track, it's brilliant. Yeah, to to it's so out. bad, it's good. So Andy's quiz, we're on to Andy's quiz. So this week, Andy, um, first up, it's it's it was another animal theme thing, wasn't it, last time? Some, yes, it was some... Beasts of the Dogs and Humans of War. And snappy, um, snappy. I asked three questions. The first was, which nation was defeated by the Seleucids in the Elephant Battle of 279 BCE? Was oh, it the well, Ptolemaic Egyptians, Galicians, got, or Bactrian Greeks? I've got Tommy Warden's answers here. Right, okay. Let's have it then. So is, it, is, this, the, is this question one? Yes. Question one. Uh, so is that the... Uh, no, no, that's not... So the Seleucids had lots of elephants. And the year was 273 BC, when the Galatians lost to the Seleucids. I think it was Galatians as well. That's the one I yeah, go for. Yeah, Galatians. Galatians, correct, yeah. okay. Okay, right. The second is, uh, what was the name of the horse whom Emperor, Emperor Caligula allegedly appointed consul? Was it Equitatus, Incantatus, or Incitatus? Well, Tommy reckons, considering the Latin root, it's Equitatus. It that's, wasn't. That's, it was Incitatus. Oh, oh Incitatus. Oh, oh. I guess Nero Equitatus was. Equitatus was a deliberate uh, red herring there. Oh, I guess, I guess Nero was, could kind of make up whatever language he wanted, really, couldn't he? Well, <laughs> he could do what he wanted. Yeah. Fine. Good, okay. la good Latin, bad history. Right. Yep. Um, which branch of the British Armed Services deployed hedgehogs when fighting the Germans in World War II? Well, Royal Navy. Know, that's the Royal Navy. Yep. It was a uh, spigot mortar, forward firing. Yeah. There's the one that fired the 24 bombs, and they only went off if they actually hit the U-boat. So if they missed, it didn't disturb the pattern for the sonar. So did they launch the hedgehogs, or...? Shot them forward, yeah. Yeah, yeah the 24 bombs, and if any one of them hit a U-boat, it would you know, have bad effect on the U-boat. But if it missed, it didn't cause a big explosion, which means you lost your uh, sonar contact, which would be the case of a depth charge or a squid blew up. Uh, so about... <laughs> Four or five times more effective than depth charges? I don't know the statistics, but you could fire them before you off the front of the ship. So you could fire them before you lost the contact and before the U-boat thought, right, now we need to dodge out the way. Because he's because if the U-boat could hear you pinging him, he knew that the ship was some distance away. So that in theory, it was safe until no, the bombs landed Did this come before or after the squid? Um, before. It was pre-squid, hedgehogs before squids then. That's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that's, um, that's that one. Great. And then so, we've got the uh, known truth. The known truth, yes, the extra bonus question. <laughs> yeah, which was, a revolution is an idea taken up by blank. Gnomes. Mm. No, um, the answer is bayonets. Bayonets, okay. That's quite right. a pointy, pointy answer. Yep. Okay, right. Now this week's quiz, the theme is location, location. And I'm going to give you three questions comprising the name of a region and two years of history. I, I, think, the Andy, I'm looking for, I think calling it location, location, I'm not sure we've got a big enough audience that the the makers of the location 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 tv series are going to sue us i think we could possibly use the third one if you wanted we might no no no, no it's it's location called, location look it, i've got my reasons right, oh, right so okay. um it, it's i'm giving you a region and two years and the answer to the quiz question is the geographical name of two battles which took place in or near that location in those years So the first one is Eastern Europe, 1410 and 1914. Yeah, I've got that. So we need two battles. I know yeah. that. Well, it was the, name, the name of a battle, name given to battles which took place in those years in that part of the world, the same name of the battle. Oh, okay. Right? So a battle took place at one place twice in those mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Right, well, the, the same name was got given it. to battles in battle. two different Okay, years. right, great. Right. Okay, okay. Right. got it. The second one is Central Europe, 1632 and 1813. Right, okay. 
and the third one is North America, 1861 and 1862. That's pretty close. That's that's Civil War, isn't it? I think, um, yeah, there might have been a walking tour involved on that one. Um, You've been um, (laughs) there. I think so, yeah. (laughs) Most of us have probably been there, yeah. Most have been there. Brilliant. Okay. Well, that's Andy's quiz for this week then. Always good to have that music back. So, so we're getting into the end of this now. We're into the final straight. So, so really, it's just another quick round the table or round the Zoom screen to ask what's going to be on the painting table this week. So, Adam, if I start with you, um, as you said, I, I can see you putting together tanks as we speak. But so I'm well, guessing I'm, tanks. But well, two things this week. I've prepped and undercoated these goblins I was going to do for Lords of the Rings, so they're going on. And um, even as this podcast has been going on, I've been putting together. Apparently simple to um, apparently simple to put together um, tanks. So some Pegasus ISUs. I'm also going to do some army trucks. And um, here, last from the past, a Sturmovic Airfix. Because um, whenever I go into a model store, I look to see if there's anything on sale, and I've got this. So that's going to round out my Russian army. Oh, I didn't even know. And it's just it. sword putting them together. I didn't even know Airfix did a Sturmovic. But... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a sod putting them together. <laughs> yes, okay. So that's one seventy second scale and some goblins. Mm-hmm. What a good connection. So, Dave, what about you? You're just praying for Egyptians. If the Egyptians don't arrive, what's on the list? Um, or are you just going to panic? They're on the table. They could be incompleted. Um, I'm, I'm trying to reorganise the busy cabinets at the moment to work out whether I actually need number three or not. Should we have a vote on that, everybody? Yeah. Yes, he yes, needs it. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> need number three, I might have to buy four as well. well only yes. three just isn't enough, mate, to be yeah, honest. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because if you have only three, you, you're not even, and you have to have one for left hand and one for right hand. They're probably then, cheaper during lockdown anyway. Well, yeah. that, that's the issue, because I've got the nine draw one, which has got the deeper and mixed up ones, which is very useful. That's actually next to my painting tape. No, the, the 15, nine. the 15 is the secret. You need the 15s. Well, I've got two of the 15s already, which are yeah. full. Um, I think the third one is the maximum. I mean, after that, you really are buying armies for the sheer pointlessness of it. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel sorry for what's the your poor point? Bro- I resemble that comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you are getting to Central American nonsense yeah. people and things like that. Mind I you, must... I mean, saying this, I'm only talking ancients here. I'm not talking, um, you know, World War II or, you know, really yeah. getting into Napoleonics or anything like that. So. No, I must admit, I'm looking at my 15 draw one here and there's... There's 10 mil American Civil War. There's Second World yeah, War, 15 well, mil stuff. Yeah, there's no, some no. Spanish Civil War. Remember that? Um, still have some bits and bobs of that in it. Uh, there's still some stuff I've not painted for a long time, as well as all the ancients and the Renaissance as well. So but the nine draw one I've got next to my painting table is got two drawers which are just just lead for painting at some point. So uh, oh, <laughs> so it's storage as well. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. So it's, so it's reorganisation. Well, I tell you what, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to paint this week. You're going to paint your little castle. The castle keep thing. I remember him. Yeah. Castle keep from... Uh, Bowie. Alicante. Alicante. Alicante, yes. Yeah. Yep. Adia made these and gave everybody one of these. So I've actually sub, I've undercoated it. So I think I might have to give that a go. Just yeah. for a while. And it's on, right. a it's on a 45. It's on a base anyway. Good. And if you like, I can send you some of the castle guard figures from the Monty Python and the Holy Grail to put up in the tower. I think that would be a very good idea. That would be good. All right. Then Tamsin, I think we talked about slightly earlier, we, we talked about what you were looking at this week anyway, I think. Um. Yeah, um, so I've got sci- sci-fi scatter terrain to paint up. That should take me next day or two. And then sort of the Judge Dread figures, need to do a little bit of gap filling on them, get them primed, and then I might start painting them. Okay. All right. And I think from, from my point of view, I want to try and get all of these... Um, 28 bases of of hungarian cavalry done um, and then start to make a dent in the in the infantry as well i I think the infantry be straightforward apart from these horrific um mystery i've no idea what they're wearing bowmen um but the cavalry are looking 
bright and cheerful um, at the moment sitting next to me here. So if I can get that done and then I will think about buying another couple of packets of bits and bobs, but I might actually wade into wade into the infantry before I put in an order from Essex because otherwise I'll realise there's some things that I actually want in the infantry as well and make all the whole lot consistent. Guys, can I just check? Because you keep talking about sort of like ordering stuff to paint. Have you not got a cupboard full of stuff that's waiting to paint? That's and, the point. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Loads, we don't talk about that. Your point is? <laughs> yeah, but to round out an army, you know, if you're finishing an army completely, and because this, this was a ready-made, um, I think it was a fog ready-made army from from Essex, so it's got way too much of some stuff for ADLG, but it doesn't quite have the you know the right bits for others. So I think there's some of the the more obscure hairy foot that I don't even know if you really need in the army. That you think if I'm painting them all up at one go, you want them all to be consistent. So it's almost do them all in one go. And and obviously I've got some figures that would work perfectly well that were painted 20 years ago that I don't necessarily want to to be bothered. In fact, maybe Simon, the question is um if you could remind me what that that paint stripper was that you said actually worked well and didn't stink. Um, uh, it's bio bio strip, it's called bio strip. Okay. Yeah. Bicarbonate of soda. No, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I've got saved in Amazon as well. Mixed with Lucozade or something. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and cat urine. Um, bio, so bio strip then. Um, so I might I get some bio strip. To, I use Wilco, Wilco do a similar similar own brand. Oh, really? All right. Okay. I will. If I can find a Wilkinson's, I'll be. Um, um, is that just Wilco paint stripper? Yeah, it's a sort of gloopy. It's the gloopy. Is that all, quite, all right for plastics and metal? Ooh, plastics. <laughs> the like bio strip works on plastics because. Um, I wouldn't put plastics. In, I wouldn't risk plastics in it. Okay. Yeah, the bio well, strip does. Cause I've it. stripped some plastic stuff, and the bases have, have come out intact. Who sells bio strip? Uh, I've purchased it on Amazon, but I'm sure you could find it anywhere. I'll send you the details. Maybe we can put it in the show notes. Put it on the show, yeah. We'll put it in the show notes on the podcast. Okay. So I might construct. I might do bio strip if I think that the old stuff that I've got that would round out this army would be painted so differently to this lot that it would look weird. Um, or I might just base up some old stuff to to match the basing and see if I get away with it with that. So that's probably my focus. Um, um, Andy, what about you? Well, it seems I've been commissioned to paint some um, Irish uh, plastic guys. Oh yes, you have. Yes, we've we've forced you into. We've actually made that decision for you on a democratic way. And um, and Simon, how many units of um, how many more units of, of Swedes in with yellow cuffs? Do you think now that you know how to paint yellow, um, bringing us all the way back to round to the start of the podcast? <laughs> um, I've got four more grenadier units to paint, and then about another ten or so of mounted artillery, um, light foot, and other various other troops that. Probably didn't need to buy, but I wanted to buy anyway. Okay. And what, what's, your, what's your target for next week then? Do you think it's um, the four Grenadiers or? I think the, I'm going to go for the Grenadiers and get them all, them all painted, based up in banners. Okay. That's the start. Good. Okay. Well, look, I think that's that's got us just a shade under two hours um, by the time we edit this around. We've entered done a new feature. Um, we've started to learn about, well, I've started to learn about Napoleonic Wars. We've had some um, some, some technical quiz questions some painting there's almost been some tips we talked about actually playing games yet again so thank you all for taking part um and being here thank you for listening as well um stay safe out there everybody and goodbye from me and goodbye from everyone else See ya. Bye. The other music that you have for uh, this this means war. Yeah, that's from Howard. That's Howard. Um, so Howard down the club was in Dave. What was the band? Um, so he was in Apollo four four zero. But he, he's, he's actually a. I mean, he's a producer, isn't he? He's a producer. He's a music producer. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a track him and his and things like that. That was a, tr a track him and his buddies had created and sort of sub or were going to submit. Um, to be the soundtrack for the 
Amazon series, Guns of um, Sons of Anarchy, like the biker thing. Um, but they didn't end up submitting it in the end, so he had it lying around. He said, "Do you want to use it? You know, <laughs> you can have the rights to it to use it for the podcast." <laughs> so I'm like, "Yes, it's pretty cool." Come to a good home.